Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Giant Grant Games, and today I'm here to answer the question, is it possible to beat Legacy of the Void with only zealots? Spoiler alert, it's not. So today, instead of talking about my successes, we're going to go through all of the concessions that I had to make in order to actually get through this run with what some people might consider mostly zealots only. My goal going into this run was to beat the campaign without using any combat units besides zealots, deal no damage with the Spear of a Dune, and only use photon cannons to defend against flyers. With that as the basis to start, let's get into the run. While the rules do say that no build missions don't count, I want to give this one my best shot. The objective of 4 Ire is easy, clear out the Zerg and get to the end of the mission. I'm given 32 Zealots to work with. The Zerg on the other hand has 4 Ultralisks, 3 Guardians, 2 Queens, 2 Infestors, 25 spine crawlers, 23 Roaches, 66 Hydralisks, 10 Banelings, 10 Butalisks, 480 Zerglings, and 6 Hybrid totaling 523 supply, and costing 12 times as many resources as my initial starting force. They also have upgrades, and I don't. I can rescue some additional zealots around the map, but I can never hold a candle to the zerg numbers. So I decide to drop the difficulty, and I learn something interesting. For some reason, 4 ire is exactly the same on the hard and brutal difficulties, so I guess I'm going down to normal. Normal makes the mission significantly more approachable. While I don't have the ability to dive enemy emplacements, I can follow a simple formula of pulling the enemy groups, executing them, and waiting for my shields to recharge. It's not a fast process, but it works reliably for the majority of the mission. The end is where things get scary. The hybrid kills zealots fast, and they have huge HP pools. The first three fall, but as I reach the final group, I don't have enough to fight straight up, and zealots aren't exactly known for their ranged kiting. So, I run. And run? and run, all the way back to the AI-controlled mothership at the beginning of the mission. I can't kill these hybrid, but Solenda sure can. I repeat this process two more times for the remaining hybrid, and voila! The six-minute A-move mission is done in a quick and easy 42 minutes. The Growing Shadow is impossible to do with Zealots only on Brutal. Let's talk about why. The mission begins with a short no-build segment with Stalkers. It's easy enough to not kill anything with them while getting to the base. The base segment is flat out undoable though, for multiple reasons. The crux of the problem lies in the inability to hit air. Throughout the run, photon cannons will be my main air defense structure. The mission doesn't give me any of these. The only available option to hit air is the stalker. At the eight minute mark, the first mutas hit. It's just a pair of them, but it's a huge problem. Because Protoss can't repair, and the mission doesn't give me access to shield batteries, there's no way to stop the mutalisks from slowly whittling me down. But I did come up with a plan. I start constructing a nexus at the front of my base. It gains hit points faster than it loses them while the mutalisks attack it. Once the nexus is about to complete, I cancel it for a 75% refund, and then I repeat the process. This means that the mutas are only draining about 100 of my minerals every 70 seconds or so. This works well enough for the time being, and I continue to build up. The big problem comes at the 16 minute mark. Off of my one available base with seven mineral patches, I've managed to build up about 120 supply of zealots. This is when four more mutalisks come to play. The six total mutas now deal enough damage that a building nexus dies faster than it's constructed. I cannot stall them out any longer. The objective is a Protoss base on the top left of the map. Two Zerg bases and a Protoss encampment lie between me and them. I start heading out and see what I can get done. And there are another ten mutalisks in the first Zerg base. I can't even finish that base off. And because of well-positioned enemies, I can't run past everything. Topping it off, in order to complete the mission, a flying carrier must be killed. There's no getting around it. For these reasons, it is impossible to beat this mission with zealots only. The Spear of a Dune is where I finally start to catch a break. Now I have photon cannons, so I can actually defend against air units. Flyers on the map are still going to ruin my day though. There are four power cells that must be captured in order to finish the mission. After each cell is destroyed, the enemy sends an attack wave against me. Either Nidus Worms unloading Zerg troops until destroyed, or warp prisms warping in Protoss units until destroyed. Of course, the flying warp prisms are the first to attack, meaning that as soon as I clear a warp conduit, Protoss units will indefinitely be attacking me. Fortunately, I've been in this position before. In Legacy of the Void Deathless, I opted to simultaneously destroy all of the power cells in order to avoid attack waves. I'm gonna have to do the same thing here. Unfortunately, unlike in Deathless, the Zealot is not a cost-effective way to clear around the map. The nearby power cell is simple enough to clear, just a few zerglings and hydralisks. I then move on to the center right. This is the second easiest area. 
The left has a huge number of mutalisks, and the south houses the strongest defenses of them all. Despite being the easiest, my 150 supply zealot army gets shredded. The infester's fungal growth ability is devastating. While units like marines take a higher percentage of their life and damage due to a fungal growth, at least they can fire their guns. Immobilized melee units are the most useless thing in the game. After 10 minutes of rebuilding my forces, I get to try again. My mineral fields are getting close to running out, so I decide it's time to get a move on. I set up a pylon at the bottom of the ramp to reinforce, and crash down on the center right lock. Its defenders were mostly dealt with in the last wave, so I break them easily. The army then dives the southern lock. None of the defenders have been cleared, but my army is large enough to kill the corruption while ignoring the enemies. Meanwhile, my reinforcement zealots head to the final lock and target it down. And then, Calamity strikes. An attack wave of hybrid and Protoss forces that were supposed to be heading to my base find my zealots. My base is being eviscerated by three lock attack waves at the same time. I manage to mine enough for six zealots before my probes are killed. My last resort is to dive on the final objective, the mutalisks and hydras ripping through my zealots. But just as it looks like all hope is lost, it is. My forces are eliminated with 19 of 1000 HP remaining on the objective. So I reload, wait for the hybrid attack wave to pass, and finish the objective off with no issue. After Spear of Adun, I'm given two decisions to make. First, I'm given the option to go to either Shakuras or Korhal. I'm going to have to delay Shakuras as long as possible. Without access to the Dark Templar, the missions on Shakuras are pretty rough. I need to unlock as much as I can before going there. The second choice is between the two zealot subtypes I've unlocked. Each of these zealot types has a unique attribute that gives them an edge. I will be using all three throughout the run, but I'm going to opt for the Centurion for now. The objective of Sky Shield is super unique. There are five platform stabilizers scattered around the map that need to be secured. Each is guarded by a progressively stronger force of enemies. There are two catches. First is that I'm on the clock. And second, there are air units defending the stabilizers. I can't capture them until they're destroyed. This mission is where the Centurion Zealot shines. The Dark Coil ability stuns non-massive units for a short period of time. This ability scales rather poorly into the later stages of the campaign, where attack waves get stronger, but the stun doesn't work on the most threatening enemies. But on Sky Shield, the layout is perfect for them. The map is littered with small outposts of enemies. This means that as long as I wait for the ability to be off cooldown before engaging, I can permanently keep enemy units stunned as I open up the map. This mission is already cutting it very close. Making sure I lose nothing to the groups around the map is essential. After securing the stabilizers adjacent to my base, I head to the north, clear two of the three bonus objectives, and then head to the rightmost stabilizer. Every time a stabilizer is secured, the defenders of the other stabilizers increase in number and quality. Most players save this one for last, but doing so means the defenders get a battle cruiser, which I can't beat. I dive my zealots in, clear out the ground defenders, and realize at this point that there are three banshees defending. That's not good. I grab my entire army and head to the northern stabilizer. Maybe I can salvage this. Each claimed lock gives me four minutes on the clock. I clean out the north, but there's a raven here, who I can't hit. As I resign myself to going back to the drawing board for this mission, the stabilizer secures, despite a raven being alive. I don't know why, but ravens don't count when the game is checking if an area is guarded or not. Currently, I'm in a bit of a pickle. I originally wanted to use cannons to defend against air units and not deal damage with the Spear of a Dune but the number of air units in Legacy of the Void is completely out of control. Being forced to make a tough decision, I decide that when I'm going to have to use non-zealots, I would rather use photon cannons because they cost resources, instead of the Spear of a Dune whose energy is free. I zip a probe to the right-hand side and build some cannons, and then pull banshees into them. The raven doesn't play nice, but it does allow me to confirm that for some reason the raven just doesn't count. The force stabilizer is the same idea. Zealots crash in, clear the area, and then pull banshees over to some cannons to take them down. One remaining. At this point, my army is big enough that I smash through the final stabilizer with little resistance. Only a single banshee in the air means I can build cannons right under it and finish the bonus objective that I completely remembered to do until now. Don't mind my cannons frantically shooting anything besides the banshee so I can get my last five solarite. Uh, that was almost bad. Brothers in Arms is a fun mission that I enjoy a lot, and this run is no exception. I have to kill 5 hybrid on the right side of the map and kill a keystone structure who has 3000 HP. The map alternates between two states. A normal one, where the enemy and my two AI allies are fighting until a disruption pulse is fired off, and then the disruption pulse stuns all allied and enemy Terran units for a few minutes. During the stun, the hybrid attack my allies. If my allies' command centers die, I lose. 
This is the first mission that I get to take a second base, and this is really exciting to me because I like money. I've switched off of the Centurion Zealot to the Iyer Zealot. The Centurion's stun does not work against the hybrid. The Iyer Zealot, on the other hand, has an ability called Whirlwind, which deals 10 damage per second in an area around the Zealot. This ability has one weird factor that makes it incredible here. The Zealot has no unit collision while it's whirlwinding. It can move through both enemies and allies. Against big enemy forces, this is often a liability. The Zealots will stack up and get melted by area of effect attacks. But it also covers one of their biggest weaknesses, a lack of damage density. When fighting small groups of units such as Hybrid, most of the Zealots will be stuck behind each other, doing effectively nothing. The Whirlwind ability means that for a short period of time, my entire army can temporarily hit one target, though buildings and flyers are immune. While I engage the first hybrid attack wave, I send one Zealot to clear out the bonus objective to the north. The enemies up there are all Terran, so he can clear all but one Banshee out during the stun. I don't feel like cannon rushing this Banshee, so I leave it alone for now. After maxing out is where the fun begins. The customary hybrid attack wave comes, and 80 Whirlwind Zealots melt through it in seconds allowing me plenty of time to push towards the objective. My goal is to win during the next disruption event, but I still have one bonus objective to deal with because of that banshee. I decide to recruit one of Jim Raynor's Goliaths and escort him over to the enemy banshee to take him out. And the Goliath dies. Luckily, this heroic Goliath had a brother who was desperate to avenge him. So I gently show Goliath number two where the evil banshee is, he takes it out, and I get my bonus objective. My strategy for the final disruption is easy. Walk past all the Terran, make the hybrid star on the next episode of Willow Blend, and then kill the Keystone structure. The three Dominators can put some serious area damage out with their psionic storms. I have to send my forces in waves to mitigate the damage until two of them are dead. And then I Vitamix the final hybrid in less than a quarter of a second. As I bask in the afterglow of melting one of the scariest StarCraft enemies in a fraction of a second with a meme unit, I remember something. Jim is stunned and currently being attacked by the hybrid. I burn down the keystone and less than a second later, Jim's command center dies. I got so excited by my zealots that I almost lost. After Core Hall, I head to Forbidden Weapon. This mission is a race against Mr. Laser to get to the vault at the end. This is the final time I'll be using a whirlwind zealot. I need the damage over survivability if I want to beat the clock. This is one of the final missions that I'm stuck on one base, and I'm really feeling it. The enemy Protoss have a full tech tree unlocked as well as good upgrades. I have 20 minutes to reach the end of the long path. Normally, there's a shortcut that can be accessed with the Solar Lance ability that skips about half of the enemies, but I don't have access to the luxury of Combat Spear Vadoon abilities. Instead, I wait around for half the time building up my forces. Protoss area of effect is really powerful. And because the Iyer Zealots stack, I have to be very careful around Archons, Templar, and Colossus. Otherwise, I can lose my entire army in seconds. Against Templar, I specifically opt to send small squads of Zealots to bait out the storms before engaging the main force. After destroying an enemy outpost and defending a rather large attack against my base, I realize I have one minute left and a quarter of the path remaining. I charge my 50 Zealots through the remaining Taldurim forces drop Temporal Field on a particularly scary Templar, and bash the first pylon wall. Dive through the second and grab the objective while the laser is literally touching it. I held off going to Shakoros for as long as I could. Without the right options available, Amon's Reach is a frightening mission. Normally, it's pretty simple. The ground is littered with a powerful army of Zerg units, but the enemy detectors are fairly limited. This is conveniently the mission where you get to unlock the Dark Templar. Instead, I'm gonna have to clear my way through the old-fashioned way. During the mission, five Void Thrashers spawn. Each will drain the hit points of the shuttle launch bay as long as they remain. On Brutal, they spawn fast, and the bay can only take a few minutes of punishment before falling. Fortunately, the first Void Thrasher is basically unguarded, and the only way to take damage from him is to stand in these circles. Completing Glacius before heading here was important. Doing so unlocks a Sentinel variant of the Zealot. Unlike the Whirlwind or Centurion Zealots, the Sentinel does not gain any in-combat improvements. Instead, it has the ability Reconstruction, reviving it from the dead once every three minutes. The fact of the matter is that Zealots are never going to have the incredible damage output of Marines or Raptor Zerglings. I'm also lacking the incredible mining power of the Mule or the steady reinforcements provided by Zergling Reconstitution. Instead, I'm going to have to focus on making my Zealots as durable as possible, playing into their only advantage over their peers. The second Thrasher is harder than the first, but it's really not that bad. Normally, approaching it is supposed to be difficult because of the first detectors that you encounter. Zealots don't care about that. After this is when the first problem of the mission arrives. 
The third thrasher is on the far side of a zerg base. I decide to kill three birds with one stone here. If I take out the zerg base, then I won't have to worry of attack waves from the left while I'm clearing the right later on. And I can take the base for myself to double my zealot production. The void thrashers now spawn nidus worms to assist them during combat. Zealots are not great at killing the worms before they start unloading, it's easy to get overwhelmed. Instead, I do something a bit cheeky. The nidus worms spawn in the same exact positions every time. I drop temporal fields on top of those positions, causing the worms to be stunned the moment that they appear, trivializing the fight. Because I saved so many of my forces with the temporal field cheese, my zealot force is looking pretty good. I don't know where the nidus is spawn in the next fight, but my force is so overwhelming that I don't care. At this point, I have enough HP on the warp conduit that I can allow the final thrasher to bombard it until I have a maxed out army, who clears everything easily. Last Stand is a timed defense mission, and my rules from the start come back to bite me here. I decided that static defense that only costs minerals is okay, because I need a way to hit air units. This rule specifically excludes the Kaidaran Monolith from being produced, which is the highest range of all the static defense in the game. It would really be a shame if this mission were to attack with units at higher range than my cannons. The first objective is to kill three Zenith Stones around the map. Normally the three Dark Templar that you start with are more than enough to deal with them while you set up static defense. I instead opt to build a large force of Zealots early on to defend. This means that once I finish off an attack wave, I can go to a nearby Zenith Stone and take it down. I've unlocked my first passive ability of the run. Photon Overcharge turns my Nexus into a giant, low DPS cannon. It's a fine ability, it doesn't cost any Solarite, and the other options don't do anything for me, so I stick with it. Once all three of the Zenith Stones are down, it's time to turtle with Photon Cannons. For the majority of the mission, there's not much to talk about. It's not ideal, but Sentinels combined with Photon Cannons and Shield Batteries is enough to deal with all of the ground lanes. The big problem comes with the back. The air attack route sends Guardians, which have 9 range. That's two more than my Photon Cannons. The first Guardian attack manages to take down multiple Photon Cannons on my side. However, they end up advancing forward enough that I'm able to build cannons directly under them and take them out. Near the end, there's just too many guardians though. The back is broken and I have no way to recover. While I do manage to hit the required 1 billion zerg on the planet, there's no way that I can get to the 1.5 for the bonus objective. It's pretty sad losing valuable solarite at this point in the run. Temple of Unification is infamous for being arguably the biggest difficulty spike in StarCraft 2. The enemy is relentlessly aggressive, has a full Protoss and Terran tech tree to work with, and the map requires you to secure five locations at the same time. It's pretty funny that one of the hardest campaign missions got translated into one of the easiest co-op missions. In order to secure all five locks, I'm gonna need a ton of money. I expand as fast as possible and fortify my bases. Zealots are able to clear the ground, however every unit around the lock must be killed, including the Void Rays. I start building Photon Cannons and Shield Batteries near the lock. This works well enough, and one lock out of five is secure. And then I get to the middle lock. Three wraiths, two banshees, three void rays, and a carrier. That's a lot of air. I try to set up a cannon cluster, but the enemy keeps attacking me. As long as both enemy bases are sending constant raids, I can't secure these areas on the map with cannons. I head towards the Protoss base with a maxed out army and full upgrades. Over 10 Void Rays, a bunch of Colossus, some Scouts, and Carriers slaughter my force before I can do anything against them. Void Rays and Banshees then clear out my cannon emplacements on the map. There's not enough available money to remax, and I reset. At this point, I'm 100% sure that the correct answer is to get a quick Zealot max out and kill the Protoss. I need to stop one of the factions from harassing me if I want to finish. I decide to switch to the Centurion. Their ability to charge through each other will be helpful in the choke points of the Protoss base. This was not correct. The Centurions do about as well as before. Meanwhile, the Terran counterattacks me, and I'm dead again. After a good deal of deliberation and viewer polling, we decided that with the current rule set, the rest of Legacy of the Void can't be done. I decide to take a vote, and the overwhelming number of my viewers are cool with me powering up the weapon systems of the Spear of Adun. I do put a limiter on myself. I decide that the Spear of Adun can only be used to attack enemies where the primary threat is air units. Hitting ground targets is unavoidable because the AI loves stacking up, but I diligently try to keep things as much about the Zealot as I could. I grab Solar Lance, return to the Sentinel Zealot, and try again. Because Solar Lance use is limited and there's enough air, I must be pretty precise with my shots. The run starts to adopt a really weird sub-game of trying to lose as few Zealots as possible while lining up the enemy flyers. It's actually pretty fun. And then I died. A counterattack came in and quickly killed all of my production while I was on the map. I got stuck with almost 5,000 minerals in the bank and no ability to spend it before I was eliminated. 
it looks like I still need to kill the Protoss base. In try number four, I combine my strategies. I go for a quick push into the Protoss base, but this time with the Sentinel and Solar Lance. Being able to take care of some of the Void Rays at the beginning takes a good deal of the pressure off of my back. I manage to eliminate all of the Protoss buildings and probes, leaving only a Skytoss presence in their former base. Because these fights take so long, the enemy Terran will always counterattack me, even if I move out the moment I clean up one of their waves. After coming fairly close to losing my expansion, I decide that maybe it's in my best interest to take out the Terran as well. But first, some housekeeping. The Taldorim aren't using their base anymore, and I want it. My main base is starting to run dry, and the probes need something to do. This involves a good deal of weirdly running my zealots around, grabbing all of the remaining forces, and blasting them. Once this base is secure, I feel significantly more comfortable in fighting the Terran. This was a good move. The Terran base is incredible. Banshees and Battlecruisers deal a significantly larger amount of damage than their Protoss counterparts. It takes a maxed out army and multiple 16 Zealot warp ins to reinforce before I break the base. With both of the bases gone, there'll be no more reinforcements or attacks. I can take my time clearing each of the locks. Even when breaking them takes 40 or 50 supply, I don't care. With four locks secure and the final one free of enemies, I remember that the Titanic Warp Prism exists as a bonus objective, so I can't unrush it. After the pain that was the Temple of Unification comes the Infinite Cycle, a no-build mission with Artanis and Kerrigan. Unfortunately, Kerrigan never finished her Zealot training, so she has to sit out. The problem is, Artanis doesn't actually do any damage. He's built as a powerful tank and healer, while Kerrigan is the glass cannon. There are multiple events in this mission that are timed, and Artanis doesn't have the damage output to complete them. Depending on the event, he either gets overwhelmed or can't reach the ending safely. While the rules do say that no build segments of the campaign don't count, I still get a bit sad when I can't make them work out. Harbinger of Oblivion is a mission whose difficulty always surprises me. After a short no build segment where I slowly peel the defenders apart with my centurions, I get my base and turn my eyes on the four objectives. While Solar Lance is technically allowed, I'm trying my best to avoid using it. I probably should have, but I was being really stubborn. Normally, on the left-hand side, a couple of adepts can slip by and kill the objective uncontested. I try to do this with my sentinels, and it doesn't work. Instead, I opt to fight with Kerrigan's support. While she does help a bit, her zerglings do a great job at getting in my way, and she doesn't actually bring any heavy firepower to the table, so it's more symbolic than anything else. The first objective is poorly defended and falls quickly, but the remaining three are too much for a straight-on fight. I opt for a hit-and-fade strategy with my new recall ability. These sort of strategies work well for zerglings only, but are really clunky for the big zealot. My first attempt on the left objective was a resounding failure. A few of my zealots get to the objective, but the majority get caught in a really impressive surround by the AI. The objective lives with 5 HP, and the shields start to recharge. After rebuilding for a while, I try again. There's an upside to requiring multiple waves. Enemy hybrid don't have an energy regeneration rate. The dominator who crushed me with Psy Storm last fight can only auto-attack now. This makes finishing off the objective and recalling much safer. The third objective has the strongest defenses, but there is a trick. There are two entrances to this base. Attacking from the northeast drastically reduces the number of defenders. While I do lose 50 supply of zealots, I get the objective, so I feel fine. The mission ends in failure when Kerrigan's Hive dies around the 25 minute mark. I have some time to rebuild before striking the last Void Crystal, but the enemy attack waves are slowing me down a ton. I lose here multiple times. The Banshees and Void Rays manage to snipe my Nexus, I go all in, and fail. I end up utilizing Kerrigan's forces to help distract some of the attackers so I can clean up more easily. At 24 minutes and 15 seconds, I dive. My entire strategy is to repeatedly spam F2 and click the objective. This means that every time a zealot revives, he is commanded to attack the crystal, and with 15 seconds remaining, the crystal falls. If the theme of Zerglings only was mining out the map, Legacy of the Void is all about having no time remaining on objectives. This is getting a bit ridiculous. After Ulnar, I opt to do the Purifier questline before the Taldorim. After an unskippable no-build segment with Long Zealots, I get my base. Escorting the Megalith to each lock can be a pain. While it has a lot of bulk, the Megalith's attack is horrible, and its AI is really dumb. All in all, unsealing the past is not a very difficult mission if you follow a few tricks. The AI-controlled Megalith will always walk in a set path until finding an enemy, and then attacks it. Once it reaches the lock, it fully heals. Letting the Megalith do its own thing early on in the mission is a great way to get some extra forces out before things get tough. There's a Zerg base to the left of the second lock. Clearing it out both increases my income as well as stops the majority of the attacks during the mission. 
After the second lock, my army is large enough that anything on the ground will get shredded, and anything in the air will get solar lanced. But every plan has its weakness. I did not properly prepare for a bunch of cliff-dwelling zerg. I can't solar lance these guys because there are no flyers, and I can't attack them. The megalith dies, and I restart to grab the deploy pylon ability. After reaching the same spot, I realize that the entire high ground is covered in creep. There's no valid place to put a pylon to warp in high ground zealots. I try some janky stuff like a cluster of shield batteries to protect the megalith while the zealot absorbs shots, but nothing worked. In the end, I had to fold and admit these were close enough to being flying units and unleash the lance. I kept the deploy pylon ability though. The megalith gives high ground vision, allowing me to use the pylons to access the bonus objectives. The remainder of the mission isn't particularly eventful. It took me a couple tries to get through the difficult cave sequence, but eventually the zerg base dies and all of the locks are claimed. I opted to go down the purifier quest line because unsealing the past is pretty easy, but purification is an absolute mess. This mission sports the most dangerous hybrid in StarCraft II, and they attack from all angles and often. I start off with a single base, which is not nearly enough money for the mission. When all the circuits in section are destroyed, an AI attack wave spawns and clears out a Zerg base. I need the minerals at those bases if I'm going to keep up. Each quadrant has a sort of theme. The scariest is to the east, who has a huge number of flyers, including the Viper Spellcaster who can disable attacks in an area. Slightly easier, but still tough, is the south, who sports mass and fester and can immobilize my forces. Next is the north, who likes banelings and ultralisks, and then the west, whose theme seems to be not having many units. All I really have to do on that side is click on the three null circuits and they die. Unfortunately, the campaign is pre-creep nerf, so it literally takes decades for the creep to recede. This base is secured at the seven minute mark, and I don't get a nexus down because of creep until 16 minutes. As I start to pressure the second lock, the AI is getting aggressive. Zealots are not nimble units, and the ground path to the bottom of my base is a long one. I have to fortify the area. Shield overcharge is integral here. Using its damage absorption, I can target down the null circuits, though it is a one-way trip for most of my zealots. Once the hybrid behemoths start attacking, I'm in trouble. In addition to having an area cleave attack, they unleash a wave of Nickelodeon goo that slows the attack speed of all my units. Each behemoth guarantees heavy losses. The top falls at the 13 minute mark, but I'm forced to idle around for a long period of time after that. The next six minutes are filled with me macroing up and defending against attacks. Eventually I get impatient and launch an attack on the south. I thought that the right was filled with flyers, but it turns out the south is too. I didn't bring Solar Lance to this mission because I didn't have the Solarite to afford both it and Shield Overcharge. I literally have no way to fight the air. I get slaughtered, counterattacked, and die. Trying again, I use Temporal Field to stun the Mutalisks and target down the circuits. I get slaughtered, counterattacked, and die. This time, I wait until a hybrid attack, clean it up, and push the bottom. And it goes fairly well. With only three objectives remaining, I figure the final area might not be that bad. No infestors means that my zealots can't be locked down. The large flyer numbers are annoying, but that means that I can path right past them, there's not much to block me, and I can probably just continue my strategy of targeting down the objective and ignoring everything else. I get slaughtered. But because three of the four zerg bases are dead, I don't get counterattacked, and I don't die. I rebuild, try again, and finish off the last circuit. Heading to Slain, I unlock the final passive ability for the run, Repair Beam. Its HP restoration only works on robotic targets, meaning that I'm stuck with the Sentinel forever. And while the healing is significantly worse than really any other healing option in the campaigns, it does mean that I will be able to go into every fight at full health, playing into the durability theme I've opted for. Steps of the right showcases why this durability is so important. Whenever the Terrazine Fog arrives, waves of spooky ghost enemies attack me. They're significantly weaker than their non-Halloween counterparts, but they have all levels of technology from all three races available. Instead of Solar Lance, I use Temporal Field. Being able to segment and disable enemy ground groups is a best option to engage early on. After the first fog, I need an expansion. The base's location makes it difficult to defend during the fog, but I need a huge mineral income for this mission. There are two threats that can eliminate me, the fog and the sky toss attack waves. The fog sends a lot of long-ranged air units. The only thing that can hit them is my nexus, and the nexus does damage very slowly, meaning I have to sit zealots in front and soak shots, the four objectives on the map are actually a lot less difficult than I thought they would be. The mission expects me to make Void Rays, and the AI has some decent anti-air, and a lot of anti-armored immortals. Every base has a surprising lack of anti-zealot though. Because the Sentinel is a robot, not biological, the enemy Archons, which are normally the counter to zealots, aren't actually good against them. 
and the main objectives don't even have the ability to attack ground units, which is something I didn't know before. There's a bonus objective to destroy two Taldor and motherships. Unfortunately, my zealots can't leap up and chew on their starships, so I'm out of luck. The rest of the mission is a pretty simple rotation. Defend the attacks on my base, clear to the objective, use shield overcharge to snipe it, and pull back with a decent number of forces remaining. This was a surprisingly easy mission for how late into the campaign it is. Rakshir sucks. The mission is a simple tug of war. Push Alarak across the map to win. The problem is that the Taldorim are keenly aware that I'm doing a Zealots only run, and they love carriers. My plan is pretty simple. Get Alarak to a safe spot and build up a defensive line. Max out on Zealots and bank up 200 solar energy. And then make a monster push down to the end. It doesn't work. Starting at the 20 minute mark, the game starts repeating a cycle of attacks forever. An attack wave hits, and then one minute later, another attack hits, and then 30 seconds later, a third hits. The time between these attacks alternates between 30 seconds and one minute. Each attack wave has air units that need to be solar lanced for me to progress. This means that I need a solar lance on average every 45 seconds. And solar lance has a one minute cooldown. And the Spear of a Dune takes two minutes to get the 50 energy required to use it. If I hit the 20 minute mark, these repeating attacks start and I'm dead. I have to rush and manage my energy perfectly. Instead of building a safe defensive line, I aggressively clear to the enemy base and use just a couple cannons to take down some voids. Being unable to max out makes the fight tough. The hybrid dominators dish out pain and the pre-placed air units are spread out thin, making solar lances difficult to land. It took a few resets, including losing my main, but the combination of learning the fight and getting some lucky lances was enough to finish the mission before the insanity began. Also, the bonus objective on this mission is flying, because everything in Legacy of the Void flies. I delayed Templar's charge as long as I could. This is one of the missions where I needed to have a plan before the run even started. There's no room for decision making on the fly. The mission is incredibly starved for resources and built to be completely inaccessible by ground forces. By no uncertain terms, this is supposed to be the carrier mission. Clearing the beginning phases of the mission is difficult. I couldn't bring shield overcharge with me because I needed Solarite for time stop. My goal is to finish off all three power cores quickly. The attack waves are pure air and eventually become mass battlecruiser Banshee. I will get overwhelmed. Each base mines for three to four minutes before being exhausted. After securing the third mineral line, I get working. For my first objective, I use the time stop ability, dive zealots past the defenders, snipe it, and recall. Each mineral lost is precious here, so I do my best to keep as many forces alive as possible. The next objective is also where I want my next base to be. This means I have to do a full clear of the area. After it's secured, I throw down eight warp gates and start building up resources. At this point, the battlecruiser attack waves have started. This is a signal that I need to go or the AI is gonna start bleeding me dry. The final objective has a bit of a problem. Not only is it stationed behind one of the most heavily defended bases in all of StarCraft II, but it's also on an area of high ground with no ramp and no way for ground units to get vision of the area. My plan here needed a very specific set of Spear of a Dune skills, all used in tandem to work. I recall my 20 zealots to the Nexus. This gives them a temporary shield, and now they run. All of my zealots charge into the base that has tanks, bunkers, hybrid, elite Thor, and a planetary fortress. As soon as I get close, I time stop, use Solar Lance onto the high ground, and then use the vision granted by Solar Lance to deploy a pylon onto the high ground. I then use my 11 warp gates to reenact the Legacy of the Void opening cinematic, destroy the power core, and even manage to recall home. Templar's Charge is another no build mission, but this time there are actually zealots to work with. The dungeon is a linear cave, and I start with some Iyer zealots as well as their step zealot Artanis. The mission is very light on area damage, meaning the Whirlwind pushes out some serious pressure. Artanisil's Astral Winds do a great job at keeping the boys alive. After the Purifier forces have been rescued, I get some Sentinels to work with, making this the only time that I get to play with two Zealots at once. The mission is easy outside of the final chamber. Infinite Zerg spawn from two caves and Nidus Worms. The boys can't kill Zerg faster than they spawn, and the blue energy that I've been running from is approaching quickly. The Zealots sacrifice their lives to buy Artanis enough time to collapse the rocks and kill the worms. Then, I dive Artanis into the blue goo and use its damage over time to kill a majority of the Zerg forces for me, leaving only two wounded Ultralisks to finish off. The Host is the biggest macro mission in Legacy of the Void. In addition to the typical, each objective is defended by a progressively stronger group of enemies, the defenders here respawn. This is a big problem. The beginning of the mission goes off pretty well. The first three shards each have a mineral field associated with them, meaning that my income here is the highest that it will ever be. 
Clearing the second shard starts to showcase the big problem for the mission. Flyers are already obnoxious, but infinitely respawning flyers are out of control. Even when using all of my Spear of Adun abilities, I'm sustaining high losses each fight. Thankfully, there are three AI allies that can be rescued on the map. Their attacks that they send are pretty underwhelming, but they do have literally any ability to hit air, so I take them. After 30 minutes of running around clearing the eastern half of the map comes the difficult part. I dive the fourth shard with Alarak's support, a maxed army and maxed upgrades. I manage to win the fight, but I lose 120 supply in the process. And then I try the final shard. It can't be that much more difficult, right? Well, I lose 150 supply, dealing about 500 damage to the void shard. Units were having a really hard time getting to the objective. For wave number two, I had to resort to using time stops so my zealots could navigate the traffic. It really feels like a shame that such a large amount of this campaign boils down to ignoring unkillable enemies and sniping objectives. It is the nature of challenge runs that at times the only viable solution isn't the most exciting, but I can't help but feel that Legacy of the Void's mission design is not doing this run any favors. The last stop is the time defense mission Salvation. There are two things to keep track of here. First are the lane attacks. My three allies are positioned at the end of each lane, but they need assistance holding off enemies. Similar to the host, my allies aren't exactly stellar, but they do have any amount of anti-air. The majority of enemy attacks are these lane waves, and they're not much to talk about. The scariness comes from the Golden Armada attacks. These airstrikes come in from angles that the AI defenders can't reach. Why are the air units the one thing I have to manage on my own? Starting out, things go pretty well. The air attacks are minor, and my front line means that my allies take almost no losses during every fight. Upon reaching 50% is where everything starts to break down. I lose the ability to Solar Lance, and now have no effective way to fight the ever-growing air forces. I have to start getting cute. Using Time Stop to cannon rush a mothership is hilarious, but not reliable. Eventually, Tempest center the mix, and that spells my doom. Tempest DPS is not great, but they have insane range. There's no way cannons can ever kill them. To make things worse, my allies really like ignoring the Tempest, letting them slowly clear out the bases. I have no available cooldowns and no way to hit the enemy. I'm dead. So in the final minutes of this run, I have to change another rule. The Kaidaran Monolith isn't the greatest defensive structure, but it can always fire back. I add them to my list of available defenses. They are enough support to get me to the final, unending Tide of Protoss. And then I have to spend half an hour trying to figure out how to not die to the final seconds of this mission. The enemies are crazy strong. The infinite number of Dragoons, Immortals, and Carriers shred my maxed out Zealot Force in seconds, and kill my allies just as quickly. In the last seconds, I'm frantically building anything I can to soak shots for the Keystone. Everything ends up dead, but I do manage to finish the mission. So let's try to answer the question in the title of this video. Can you beat Legacy of the Void with only Zealots? Everybody is entitled to their own opinion on what exactly counts and what doesn't, but I'm gonna say no. There's just way too much air to count this as a zealot only run. Maybe I should have dropped the difficulty down from Brutal, or maybe you guys think this is fine, but I'm not convinced that it's possible to beat this game with only zealots.